For those of you who celebrate Pi Day, this is for you. Um, the, rest of, the rest of you probably hate us right now, but I did get something for the rest of you too. I got you this. <laughs> Somebody posted that on the <laughs> Slack channel at work this morning. I couldn't resist grabbing it. All right, but we're not here to talk about Pi Day. We're here to talk about uh, Postgres, which needs no introduction. However, you need an introduction because this is my first time at scale. So I'm kind of curious a little bit about, about all of you. Um, real quickly, show of hands, how many of you would consider yourself new to Postgres? I'm curious. OK, a few people new to Postgres. How many of you guys work with Postgres like in your job? Show of hands. It's lots of people, cool. Um, I'm kind of curious, how many of you would you consider yourself like you're responsible for a Postgres database? Um, I, I, so like, as in like if, if you kind of write some SQL queries, you build an app, but somebody else kind of takes care of the Postgres database mainly, um, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking like if you're kind of the person maybe who, you know, whether it's making an API call or whether it's racking a server, kind of whatever it is um, for like getting things wired up. If you're responsible for a Postgres database, raise your hand in some way. Cool, that's kind of interesting to see. And then two other things I was sort of curious about. I'm curious if, like I said, as scale is a new event to me. Um, is there anybody else here? This is your first time at scale? Cool, wow, that's really neat to see. Lots of people. And um, I'm curious, one other thing I'm curious about, I, I saw how this is set up uh, with almost like all these mini events inside of it, which is really neat. Um, I'm curious how many of you think you're mainly or only going to attend sessions in these two Postgres tracks? Or, so raise your hand if it's that versus going and mixing all around. I'm just kind of curious how this works out. Okay, so like a mix, yeah. Actually, and I'm, there's a lot of people I'm seeing a lot of people who didn't raise hands, so I think that means a lot of, raise your hand if you're going to multiple tracks and like checking into all kinds of things. Yeah, that's really great. That's, I, I love the way they've set this conference up. This is really cool. Uh, thanks for humoring me there. All right, so anyway, like I said, we're here to talk about Postgres, which uh, I don't think needs a lot of introduction, especially based on this quick survey. <laughs> um, one thing that Postgres is pretty well known for is standards compliance. It's one of the reasons that it's a popular migration target uh, from a lot of other databases. But there's one thing that the SQL standard doesn't really talk about very much, and that is performance. But that's not to say that there isn't this whole field of database performance and that there isn't actually like decades and decades of thinking, of research, and of an awful lot of work that's been done around database performance specifically. This goes back pretty far. Uh, a paper that I've heard referenced a few times is this one from Robert Miller, Response Time in Man-Computer uh, Conversational Transactions. This is 1968, y'all. Um, now, this is kind of more systems performance kind of stuff, but it very much lays the groundwork for a lot of the thinking around database performance as well. And then I also <laughs> grabbed a little, <laughs> I grabbed a printout of, uh, of this 1969 page from the IBM uh, System Management Facilities Manual, which also digs into this a bit. Now that's kind of systems performance, but one other thing that I, I like to point out that I think is kind of neat, um, Brendan Gregg is uh, fairly well known for a lot of his work around flame graphs and perf and eBPF and like Linux systems, things like this. But Brendan has this, this site where, this page on his website where he talks about the use method, uh, which is a method, kind of, it's been kind of more server centric, utilization, saturation, and error rate, some things to watch for. But on his page here, you'll see that he makes reference to something. He says the use method might find like 80% of your server issues, but latency-based methodologies, for example, method R, can approach 100%. If you're not familiar with method R, what he's referencing is something that came out of the database performance field. Uh, it's not something that came from systems. So like, again, like this is Brendan Gregg here referencing something that came out of the database performance professional field. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of really interesting stuff here. Now, I, I sort of threw this in this morning. I actually kind of sketch this out on the airplane on the way here, but it was just kind of some thoughts that are percolating around in my head. I, I feel like over the past few years, um, I've actually been around database performance stuff uh, quite a bit more than I had previously in my career. And I almost kind of feel like there's these two a lot, of, a lot of database performance could be almost like two different areas. There's kind of on the left side this idea of evaluating software, on the right side responding to problems. Now, 
super interesting stuff. I'm very interested in all of this. For today's talk, um, I'm actually going to be focusing more on kind of this right-hand side, responding to problems. But there is a lot of overlap. You know, like a lot of times when we, you know, software and hardware evaluation, you know, I kind of put some, you could read Jim Gray if you wanted on that so for some really old stuff. Um, a lot of times you're focused on things like price performance. Uh, performance is usually uh, the kind of canonical way that you would talk about that is in terms of throughput. Um, but throughput is, you know, I've looked at a lot of charts over the past few years. Throughput is directly a function of your response time and your latency. And response time is the thing that we wind up focusing on over on the other side of the chart when we're trying to respond to problems, when users have bad experiences, right? When, when Jim in accounting goes to the CEO and says, you know what, the payroll process every single week has taken five minutes longer than it took last week. And on the track that we're on, within a few weeks, we might not be able to get payroll done by Tuesday morning, and we're going to have trouble with the unit if we can't get paychecks out. And then everybody's paying attention, right? User experiences, focusing on response time. Th those are some of the challenges there I jotted down at the bottom are very different from the challenges on the left. Um, on the left, you're usually, you, you, your challenges you know, are usually around kind of engineering software and hardware, trying to figure out how to get the most scalability out of a system and out of an architecture, and then efficiency to keep the price reasonable. But on the right, a lot of times the challenges are actually more like coordinating across multiple departments. It's things like, okay, well, the storage guys are telling me all of their health metrics look good, and the network guys are telling me their health metrics look great, and the operating system metrics. And, it's, and then not only that, you have multiple experts, right, who each have a list, and somehow each of their lists is in a slightly different order, and you've got to figure out <laughs> whose list to use and, and which way to go. So this is kind of some evolving thoughts. For today's talk, I'm going to be thinking primarily about responding to problems when I talk about database performance. Now let's take it back a little bit. I am uh, realizing I'm, I'm, I come to a Postgres conference like this and there's a whole bunch of people that I feel privileged to hang out with who have been doing databases decades, decades longer than I have. At the same time, uh, I'm increasingly, I go to work every day and I realize I get to have the pleasure of hanging out with some, some amazingly talented and smart people who are you know, recently out of school, have tons of energy, um, and I'm realizing I'm not always the young guy anymore in the room either. Um, and I do remember I was doing databases, I was sort of started around software in the 90s, and I started with databases in the early 2000s. I very much remember kind of this, uh, this era when the, the one, you know, the main thing that we had was counters, um, we often focused on ratios. We would focus on percentages. This is what we had to work with, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, for operating systems, also for databases. And like the golden metric in the database world was the buffer cache hit ratio. That was, I feel like, the one that got the most attention. And it really was not, this is not an alien thing. There was a strong rule of thumb, like your buffer cache hit ratio is like the thing. And if that's not over 90%, start adding memory or figuring it out. Now, us DBAs back in the 2000s, we're not a dumb bunch of people. We're pretty clever, and we came up with some great solutions to this. I'm pretty sure this is still out on Connor McDonald's website. Uh, he published the choose any hit ratio script, which you can run on your database, and it will uh, bring the hit ratio to whatever you need it to be to make your consultants happy. <laughs> okay, so uh, more seriously, though, um, the, the, there's nothing wrong with ratios and counters and like using this kind of an approach, but it's not enough. Um, and while out in the industry we were kind of doing this, th there were a group of people off in Redwood Shores, kind of in a back room, hacking on kernels, database kernels, who were starting to get very frustrated and banging their heads against a wall and trying to really running into the limits of what you could do with just counters and metrics. Um, and I circled some of the year, just so you can get a sense of time frame here. This is like 1991 to 92, uh, when like this team is starting to run into these, these barriers. Um, and uh, out of the way I've heard the story told was this was an act of sheer desperation. Like it, it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't something that anybody set out to do, but, but just with with nothing, with no metrics that was leading them to figure out where they were hitting bottlenecks as they were trying to like push a system for more throughput, they finally just went in there and just basically traced everything. They're just like, just trace everything. 
start adding all this plumbing in there. And for much of the 90s, there was actually ended up being a good deal of effort in this particular database kernel to add a whole bunch of instrumentation and plumbing around tracing at a very low level. This started to lay the groundwork for something that really changed the entire field of database performance over the coming decades. So the plumbing was getting in place in the, the 1990s, and in the 2000s, there was kind of a decade of dissemination. And this is, I pulled these quotes out of this one book that I like because it's just a bunch of stories. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things that you can pull up that were written over the 2000s. And there's a lot that happened, but there's sort of two key things that I think are worth highlighting that everybody should really know about. The first that I like, that I, I would sort of want to talk about is sort of an application of queuing theory into database performance, and especially a focus on response time. And I think one of the things to realize is that part of why this took so long is that there was a very persistent belief for a long time that there wasn't any objective way to actually measure response time. Um, there was a lot of concern, maybe, maybe not unfounded, about measurement overhead and measurement intrusion, right? So it took some time, and it took Oracle kind of proving that it could be done um, really in the 90s and 2000s, that if you did it right, it was possible to do very low-level tracing and measurement of response time information without having any discernible overhead on the system. But that, that so, so that's kind of step number one, is the focus on response time and the focus on tracing and the application of queuing theory. And the hallmark of this is anytime you see this R equals S plus W, that, that's kind of a hallmark that, that somebody's talking about queuing theory. And the R in there is for response time. The second big shift that happened was sampling. Um, and this kind of came right on the heels of the first. Uh, and in particular, there's this, this idea of active session sampling. And in Postgres terminology, you could think of this as a connection um, or in any database. It's a connection to your database. An active connection is one that's currently running a SQL statement or doing some kind of a command, right? So there was this, it sounds really simple. It turns out to be very transformational to take this approach of taking, you know, at a regular interval, samples of what's going on, on just what's currently active on the system right now. Let's take a snapshot of it on regular intervals. So this was the second thing. I stuck two kind of books up here, um, and these were, if you wanted to go read something, I, I wouldn't necessarily go read these because there's actually newer stuff that, you know, you could go read that. But I put these up here. These were just two of the ones that I remember, like, getting a lot of circulation, um, really changing people's perspectives about how they approach database performance. And, like, the thing I want to point out is, again, the time frame. This is 2003 and 2004. That's just 20 years ago now. It's just, it's been a long time. So what about Postgres? At this point, I have now set the stage, and I am ready to introduce the star of the show today, the main character of our story, which is wait events. OK. Round of applause for wait events. So this has actually been all over the slides I've been talking about. This is the IBM uh, system management framework, sorry, system management facilities documentation I was talking about. And this already had the concept of tracking system wait time and CPU time, which was sort of your foundational response time and foundational queuing theory stuff. But not only that, these pages that I had pulled out from Carrie Millsap's book uh, had wait events mentioned over here. And when you talk about that formula, I didn't mention the S and the W, but it's response time, the basic formula of queuing theory is response time, service time, and wait time. And that wait time, again, correlates directly to what wait events are. So there's a whole bunch of like mathematics and there's a whole bunch of theory that's built. You can build up on top of these basic formulas and basic ideas if you do it right. In active session sampling, I had this slide up. And in the way that, oh, and I, something I should have mentioned earlier, another sort of key piece was the visualizations here. Uh, and there's a picture over on the left. But that visualization, which was done, in fact, John Bresnowich sent me this picture of his notebook, and he said he's pretty sure this was his notes from the meeting when they basically came up with the formula for average active sessions, a bunch of people sitting around a, I don't know, around a conference table somewhere just hashing out ideas. And in those visualizations, the different colors, again, are, represent different wait events. And I'll, I'll kind of get into some more details as we go. But wait events have been kind of all over, 
all of these slides I've been talking about. And weight events were, in fact, the thing that was added by those frustrated kernel engineers in Oracle version 7012 back in 1992. Uh, they were, and they're exposed in Oracle's equivalent of PG stat activity, which you would have in Postgres. And I think this is really important context because when Postgres introduced weight events, uh, it didn't happen in a vacuum. We were building on really some concepts that were much larger across the industry and a lot of theory and a lot of thinking that existed across the industry already as well. Uh, so what exactly is a weight event? Why do we call them weight events? I have a quote from Gopala Krishnan's book, which is, which is a good book for sort of a theoretical framework of all this, but I'll simplify it a little bit. The high level idea behind a weight event is that you, you're kind of, it's, you're kind of separating out, there's CPU and then there's weights. And a weight is any time that you're not on the CPU. So a, a couple general, this is the core idea behind it. There, there are some caveats, it's not perfect. It's not, it doesn't necessarily need to be perfect to be able to use it to do a lot of really powerful things. Um, but a couple sort of general rules of thumb, it's generally, you're, you're thinking here in a single dimension. So this isn't about like stacks or like you don't have weights embedded inside of other weights. Um, if you were thinking in like open telemetry terminology, this would be a span, not a trace. If, so if, you, if, if you're kind of like, if you're able to think about it that way, if that helps. Um, it does fit into larger telemetry or an application performance framework, but weight events themselves best fit within the paradigm of one process operating at one tier, right? Just kind of with this particular model. It does kind of get interesting when you start looking at distributed systems or multi-tier systems and trying to figure out how to visualize weight events. Um, it's generally not something you use for CPU profiling. Typically, CPU um, is sort of left as just CPU. Um, there are also uh, like things like perf and eBPF turn out to be pretty easy uh, to troubleshoot CPU things. When you're off the CPU tends to be also when it gets a bit trickier, um, and also when the system starts exhibiting different kinds of properties, which is why this kind of a theory and this kind of approach um, works really well. So it's not as though Postgres has been oblivious to all of this. Um, I, the earliest email I found was 2009, and I'm sure there's emails even older than this, talking about sampling approaches and profiling approaches that, that really are, demonstrate an awareness of what was going on in the larger database performance industry at the time. And you can see <laughs> lots of emails, like uh, it's just, the Postgres community is, is, has tracked with this and has been very aware of what's been going on in the, the sort of larger industry. All the way back in 2007, this is kind of a fun one, Jonah Harris was one of the key people in implementing a weight interface for enterprise DB's um, product that's a derivative of Postgres. Um, strangely, the EDB marketing team did not take Jonah's suggestion to name it Margarita. I like it. They wanted something a little more boring, so they named it Drita. But that, that, that goes back pretty far. But all of this being said, as of the year 2016, this was still the state of the world in open source community like upstream Postgres. So when you looked at a single connection coming into the database, the only thing that you knew was you had this one Boolean field that said waiting, and it would totally tell you if it's waiting on a lock. And that's not a wait event. That doesn't tell you that doesn't tell you if you're off the CPU versus on the CPU or give you any kind of information about what you're waiting for, which is the, the sort of fundamental concept. A wait event, if you're waiting, it's what are you waiting for? You're waiting for a lock, you're waiting for an IO, are you waiting for something else? Um, there's a whole bunch of things it could be. So this kind of sets the stage. Now I have taken Robert Haas's email to the hackers and I think I've presented this in an appropriate way. Um, because the Postgres community finally did get fed up with just always using debuggers and tracing tools on production databases to diagnose their wedge systems. So it took a little while. Um, but June 30th of 2015, uh, so well, June 22nd, Robert Haas put this email out, which was his RFC to replace that waiting column I just showed you with something more descriptive. And eight days later on June 30th, Amit Kapila dropped the first patch 
In sort of typical Postgres fashion, there were nine months of testing and iterating and documenting and collaborating. Um, there were developers from multiple companies, multiple continents involved in this. Patch went through about 20 iterations um, before it finally got committed. And that first patch went in March 10th of 2016 and landed in Postgres 9.6. Now, I, I sort of consider Postgres version 10 to be uh, really the first kind of complete implementation of weight events because there was still a lot of stuff missing, you, in particular the I.O. Um, that's pretty key, and that came in Postgres 10. But Postgres 9, one of the things that's beautiful and that I love about this um, is that this was, so that first patch was 200 lines of code, and the second patch was, it's in my notes here, 800 lines of code. And to me, that really speaks a lot to like, <laughs> how elegantly this was done. Um, it's, that's, for what this is doing, um, adding instrumentation of every single lightweight and heavyweight lock, all the buffer pins and auto-generating the names, like to do all of that for a code base the size of the Postgres code base and do it in only 1,000 lines of code is pretty stunning. Um, it, it was a very nice patch. It's a very nice patch. Um, this is pretty classic Postgres 2 to kind of iterate, to put the first bit out there, the core bit out there, let it bake, and then and then add the next layer in the next major version. You see a similar pattern with things like partitioning and logical replication and all of these things. Didn't stop in version 11. Uh, it has continued on. And at this point, um, weight events are pretty much a core part of the database um, that is continually developed uh, along, along with all the new features that come in. Um, I highlighted sort of two things just to kind of point them out. In version 13, um, there was just a rename of a couple of weight events. So if, if you interact with weight events, you might notice if you're looking at a version 12 database, uh, you'll see like the snake case and some of them they just converted to be camel case. Just not major rename, but consistency type of thing, but it can still look funny on a console or a dashboard um, if, if you're not used to it. Um, and then version 17, which will be coming out, uh, we ha we ha what's coming is the ability to do custom weight event types. So I expect that we'll start seeing a whole bunch of new weight event types appearing that we didn't have before. There are some gaps that you can bump into after migrating to Postgres if you're used to working with um, a, a weight interface or with weight events on another platform. Um, I will sort of say, like, we have, you know, so Postgres 17 is getting to the end of the development cycle. I think the last commit fest just wrapped up, if I understand that correctly, or is just about to wrap up. Um, so we're getting real close to kind of knowing what's going to be in PG 17. So, I'm just going to think ahead to PG-18, and I'll say if my personal wish list, if there was two things we could work on, um, it would be great to start thinking about how we can address, okay, I'm, this is me being, this is just kind of my opinion, and other people will prioritize differently. Number five, though, I think has just really, I feel like I've seen frustrate a lot of people, um, and this is, it, the, it's the commit statement. The, the, the issue is, is that like, it's easy to like commit is like the point where you have to wait a lot of times. Um, and so it's easy to kind of imagine a lot of different scenarios where the commit ends up being sort of a bottleneck or a thing that you end up waiting for. The trouble is that when you go to see what the SQL statement is, it just says commit. And you're like, well, that's not helpful. Which commit is it? <laughs> My application could be doing any of a million things here. It would be really helpful. You know, with most other SQL statements, you can look at the SQL statement and you're like, oh, I know, or I can pretty easily figure out where that's coming from in my application. Some people even do clever tricks like putting a comment in the front of their SQL statement that kind of tips you off toward a where in the source code the SQL is coming from. But commits are, you can maybe do comments on commits. I've never seen people do that. If you're using the auto commit protocol, you can't even do that. So that's one thing I'd love to try to brainstorm a good solution for is some kind of a way to track commits back to which application transaction. Um, and the second one that I'd love to see would be the Number two um, was just kind of the counters and cumulus times, which we don't have yet in Community Postgres. A lot of the code that we need is there. It's probably just a matter of adding some data structures, but some things, if I have some time, <laughs> I'll try to work on it too. Brainstorm along with all of us. Okay. <laughs> So this is a bit of an introduction and a bit of a background, but the real reason I think everybody's here today, well, maybe not, the, no, maybe not everybody, but I think a lot of people, um, understanding the background, the philosophy is nice, but what you really wanna know is, okay, I've got a problem. <laughs> How do I fix my problem, right? 
um, how do I actually use this stuff on my database? Um, whether you're a developer, whether you're an administrator, um, how can you do this? So the gold standard here is, is method R. Um, I'm, I'm not going to kind of launch into a full standard. That's my perspective on it, at least. Um, and the reason I actually think everybody should learn method R, I think. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to say that. I think everybody should. And, and my, my first reason for saying that is it is the best thing I have ever seen to teach you how to ask the right questions at the very beginning of the process. Um, a lot of the method R material, it teaches you at the very beginning how to, so just a simple example of this is that like I, I've had lots of interactions uh, with customers or with Postgres users where somebody comes in and say, I've got a big problem. And okay, what's the problem? They're like, well, this one metric doesn't look right. You know, and just pick your metric. And, and okay, well, we could dig into that. Um, but you know, sometimes you can spend like you know, two weeks digging into this one metric, whether it's some kind of a hit ratio, whether it's like a latency metric, and then you can make an improvement and after you know, bury, you've put two weeks into this thing and then maybe it doesn't actually have any impact on your actual application or your end users. And what Method R really teaches you to do is to take the step back and start at the very beginning of like, okay, we need to really start with like user activities, start with user actions, um, define things in that way and then work backwards from there. That way you know that the work you're doing is going to have an impact on the business, have an impact on your application and on the end users uh, in a measurable way. It's very, very good for that. Um, we're not able yet to do tracing in Postgres, but, but what we have is the ability to do the sampling-based approach that I talked at the beginning. And so here's a basic methodology that I, this is the methodology I'm going to walk you through. Uh, which is based on a sampling approach. This methodology, I, I didn't really invent most of this, but this is what I have seen and a lot of people have seen. The reason to follow a method like this is it is just the fastest way to get to understanding a problem and finding a way to resolve it and move forward. It's just faster than anything else I've seen. Scrolling the wall of metrics and looking for the one that jumps out at you or kind of like using your intuition about like, well, I've seen this one problem six other times, we should just first look at this problem because it's such a common problem. You know, you, you really can find some great wins with these ways. You can also sometimes sort of end up, you know, maybe not so anything bad happens, but you lose two weeks and then you're kind of like starting over. This methodology is the most reliable thing I've ever seen to get you to a problem and an answer fast that actually makes an impact. So let's walk through it. The starting point is having some kind of a repository of historical performance data. And what this actually means is this, that PG stat activity view uh, in Postgres. And, what it, and I've got a kind of snapshot of it here. And what you want to be doing is just taking snapshots of it on some kind of a regular interval. Um, if you're doing a batch processing system, you, know, you might only need to just grab a snapshot once a minute or something. If, if your job runs for 12 hours, that might be enough data. A lot of transactional systems I've seen people do every five seconds or every one second. That's, those are pretty common sampling frequencies. Um, and, and that works fine. That's been, uh, that's, I think that's been proven to be pretty safe. So you, but the key thing is you do the same interval. So you, so you set a regular interval. There are some tools out there that, that can do this for you. You can do it yourself. So every one second, it can be as simple as this. This was from a blog post that I did a few weeks ago about UUIDs, and all I did was just a little bash script that you can see up here, um, and it's on the blog too. I sleep for 15 seconds, and then I run a SQL query, just dump everything from PGStat activity in CSV format. I took that file, I opened it in Excel, I did a pivot table, and then I did a stacked, stacked line chart, and I got this. And this right here is a visualization of the average active sessions on, on the system. And that's, it can be as simple as that. You can do this with Excel in a CSV file. You can also, there are also much more sophisticated tools out there. Um, in the RDS world, Performance Insights does this for you. It takes, those, it takes those samples and stores them and then allows you to slice it and dice it. Go to the Postgres monitoring wiki page. Um, there's a whole bunch of tools now. It doesn't tell you which ones do wait events and which ones don't. Um, I don't know everything. Uh, I do know that the, the POA, the Postgres workload analyzer, does have the ability to do a wait report by using the PG wait sampling extension. Um, I believe Datadog, DBM also has some support. PG Analyze um, has wait events instrumentation, and there's probably more too that I don't know about. 
So there's a lot of sort of sophisticated toolings available. POA is open source as well, um, so you know uh, that, that that's an open source option if that's what you're looking for. So that's the first step is to have that repository. The next step is scope, first scoping. And scoping is really important. And then the second thing after you scope is to grab your top SQL and to grab your top wait events for that top SQL. Now, I sort of snapped a photo from Carrie Millsap's really, really old book, but it's, it's, it's a good picture about scoping on the left here. The idea behind scoping is, like in this picture, there are seven people who are doing work in your database, all right? So we've you know, got Preston, Alexander, Wallace, Nicholas in there. And what we're interested in is we're interested in Wallace's problem. Wallace had a problem, not Nicholas, but Wallace. And his problem only, his performance problem only happened between sort of time T1 and T2. So what scoping means is I've got all this data. These are all these snapshots that were taken of PGSAT activity. Imagine that just each one of those vertical lines is PGSAT activity. I've got seven connections to the database, one for each person, and they're each doing some work. And what we want to do is we want to solve Wallace's performance problem between T1 and T2. And this is actually a counterexample, and what Carrie is showing in this illustration, as says it in the description, is like in this example, we have correctly scoped down to the right user, but we haven't correctly scoped the time frame. And so when you just sort of look at, aggregate all of that data, you're still not going to quite get the right answer. So what scoping means is that you want to get as narrow as possible down to the specific user, the specific action, the specific time frame that you're trying to problem solve for. And this will follow on from, you know, when you're kind of doing a method R approach, the first question you asked, which was, let's just get specific about, you know, the user impact and kind of the user story that we're trying to solve here. So once you've narrowed it down, then you're going to basically summarize the data that you're looking at there, and that's grabbing your top SQL. You can just kind of count samples at that point, so aggregate and sort. I have an example just from a chat I had with somebody on the Postgres community Slack a while back. It was a long time ago now. But in this example, there, you, just, you can see what they're doing. Just counting the number of sessions and then the state and the weight event. And it's kind of as simple as that. You can grab your top weight event, and then you can, sorry, you grab your top SQL statement, from those periods, because you can see the SQL statements in PGSTAT activity, and then you'll be able to see, you can filter on that SQL statement and see what are the wait events that are showing up. Yes? Uh, what do C, S, and D stand for in this card? In his example, I think uh, D was disk, CP, C was CPU, S was synchronization, like a lock or something. Um, it's not so much the important the specifics here. The, I mean, the idea is that they're different, like either the C, it could be on the CPU, or it could be waiting for something. Um, and the profile will show you as you start to sort of count, you can see, you know, 80% of the time we were sitting on the disk, which, which we'll kind of come to. Um, so then the next thing, top SQL and top wait events, you have a top SQL, and what you're going to do is you're going to break down your top SQL. So the, you're going to break it down in two dimensions. First, you're going to look at the weights for that SQL. The second thing you're going to do is look at the plan for that SQL. And this is kind of like almost every time that I, I have, I, I'm interacting with a, a Postgres user or, or a customer of AWS, and it's a performance question. I says, the first two questions are always the same. It's like, do you have a performance insight screenshot, and do you have your explain plans? <laughs> That's just always it. I mean, much of the time, you ask those questions, and somebody goes and looks at Performance Insights if they didn't already, and, and they're like, oh, I see the problem, and they fix it, you know? <laughs> or look at the explain plan, and if, you know, if, if somebody's familiar with reading an explain plan or if they're able to figure it out, a lot of times that takes you right to the answer. So the explain, it's going to give you, if you're not familiar with explain, it's a command, it's a SQL command that you can use. You give it your SQL statement, and it tells you how it's going to execute your query. Most people in this room said you were familiar with Postgres, so I assume you're pretty familiar with it. Um, I'd just like to run through, I bet most of you have already seen these, but there are some tools out there to help with explain. I'm a text-oriented kind of person, so I'm a big fan of Depeche's website because it's very text-oriented. Um, I do like to point out, if you didn't know this, you can obfuscate queries if you use this tool. And another thing is, is that FYI, this, this is available under a BSD license as well. So it is possible if you work in like a regulated industry or if you're in a large company and there are data sensitivity things, you can stand up a version behind the firewall. That way you're not posting, you know, you may not be able to post SQL plans to a set on the internet. But if you can, that's even easier because his website is great. And it'll give you something like this. So you put your SQL plan in there and it formats it very nicely. 
I tend to click the button that says exclusive color mode. The reason is, back to method R, focusing on time and response time, this draws my eyes to the line. It, it, what it does is it looks at the time that each step of the plan is taking, and it takes your eyes straight to the one that's taking the most time, which is where you want to start. I've looked at plans that were hundreds and hundreds of lines long. You know, like I, I think if you're imagining a plan that's like only five or six lines, it's really simple. It's, it's probably um, not as big of a deal. When you start to deal with people that have like, you know, or plans that have like, you know, multiple subqueries, maybe correlated subqueries, doing a whole bunch of joins, and you can get these plans that are very, very large and take a lot of work to read. So having a tool like this can be really helpful. Now, if you're more of a visual person, instead of a, less, uh, instead of a textual person, there are visual tools out there as well. PG Admin is on the right here. Um, Delivo's PEV tool I have on the left. Both of these are under Postgres license um, and available as well. And then one final plug I like to stick in here is for a tool that I've put out on GitHub called DCEF. Um, this is a tool, it, it's just kind of a, a wrapper around explain. Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, it's a wraparound explain. What it does is it kind of, instead of just giving you the explain, it creates a whole report. So the explain is in the middle, but then what it does is on the top, it gives you the timestamp of exactly when it, the explain was run, exactly what version it's running against of Postgres, and then it knows the version, so it's smart enough. It will actually make sure to include all of the explain options for your version. So if you're on Postgres 15, it knows it can add a couple other options to get more data automatically puts the options on, dumps the plan. The other clever little trick that it has that I really like is that it's able to detect all of the, the tables that were accessed by your query. And then in this third section here, what it's actually doing is it's dumping out all of the optimizer statistics for just the objects accessed by the query. So it's got things like the number of distinct values, the cardinality of the tables, the number of blocks, for each of the, the indexes, it'll tell you the selectivity, cardinality of those indexes, like all of those stats. And that's really helpful, just to give a, a very concrete example of, of where this is helpful, is literally just last week, I was working with a Postgres user based in France. And in this particular case, there is medical data involved. And because there's medical data involved, all of my interactions with this customer, um, they happen to be an AWS customer, I'm not allowed anywhere near that system. <laughs> Uh, so all of the interactions consist of like, you know, okay, can you run this explain and put, you know, it's all through the case, right? You know, can, you know, you request information, can you run this explain, post things into the case? Tools like this are really helpful for just reducing the number of round trips. Um, and if you're in like a, a consultancy type of line of work, even internally, if you're in the, like the central DBA team and you work with dev teams, it can, I, I like tools like this because they can just kind of like, gets you a whole bunch of information in one shot so you don't have to go back and forth a bunch of times. It pairs well, I have this little note in the corner with this thing called PG Collector, just a quick plug for that too. That's kind of a neat little tool that um, a coworker of mine, Mohammed, maintains. Um, and it's just a little script that you can run that generates a report for the instance with things like the number of tables, the largest tables. It's just kind of one of those things where it's kind of reducing the back and forth um, with somebody when you don't have direct access to the system and you're trying to help them out. So those are a couple of tools around doing the explain. And the very last step is once you have this information, then you finally do your investigation. So you have, you know, you've, you've got your repository, you've scoped down your problem so you know exactly which data you're looking at. For that data, you've figured out your top SQL statement. For your top SQL statement, you've gotten the weight events and the plan. And now you start to look. And what you look at is what is the top weight event that you're looking at. And in the plan, what is the top step? So your plan, for example, if there's three tables, maybe it starts with table A and it uses an index. Maybe it, then it joins that data in with table B and it maybe uses a hash join. What you're gonna do is focus on the one step that takes the most time. Quick word on this. Um, I mentioned uh, Depeche's website before. There's a clever little trick with this website, which is that all of these plan nodes are clickable. So this is another thing. You don't need to try to learn everything about the Postgres optimizer today to become an expert. You can learn a lot of this stuff as you go. If here, if you don't know what an index scan is, you just sort of take your mouse like this, you hover over the word index scan, and then you click on it, and it takes you to a page like this. And he explains right on his website what an index scan is, he gives some examples, how it works. That's just, a, I find that to be a really helpful tool, and it helps you to learn as you go when you're working with Postgres. 
Um, and a lot of you in the room said you have quite a bit of experience with Postgres. These are great tools to pass along to your developers as well that you work with and that you support. The, as far as wait events go, the best reference that I'm aware of right now, um, I'm not just saying this because they paid me to say it, <laughs> is the RDS documentation. Uh, and this was, a, this was just a, a really fantastic effort and, and project that I've, I've talked about a little bit. Uh, but they have a, in their docs, they've set up a section where they go through a whole bunch of the most common wait events. And for each one of those wait events, there's a pretty long page kind of like this where it tells you a little bit of context and background, some likely causes, uh, and some suggested sort of actions. So if you're seeing this wait event, what might you want to consider to optimize the performance of like whatever SQL statement is causing this wait? So. Yeah, uh, th well, this is just documentation. And so th th that's a good question because you asked about Aurora. And I, I do just want to mention there, there is separate documentation for Aurora from the RDS, like open source Postgres documentation. So uh, you, you could accidentally land on the wrong doc page, like if you searched on Google. Um, the Aurora docs are going to have information that is specific to Aurora. If you are working on community open source Postgres, this, the RDS open source documentation will apply the same um, to open source Postgres. Uh, all of this wait event stuff, it's the same. Like this where like RDS Postgres uh, is not changing like the architecture of Postgres. Um, it's, it's Postgres running in an EC2 instance with an EBS volume underneath it. Uh, so it's, you know, all of the advice here. Now, the one thing that you will bump into, like, you know, it might mention a specific CloudWatch metric, like looking at your EBS IOPS. You know, if you're running in a different, if you're running on your own server, on your own rack, you know, you'll have to translate that into like, okay, what are the specs of my hard drive, right? Or what are the specs of my storage array? Um, so, but those translations aren't hard to do, and it's not changing kind of the basic architecture of how, of how the advice is applied. You don't want to land on the Aurora docs, though. Those are, I mean, a lot of it's the same, but since they're both there, just go to the RDS docs. That will apply correctly if you're on community Postgres. So I have one quick example to shoot through, um, and then I don't want to keep you too long because I bet you're hungry. <laughs> so let's, let's walk through one kind of uh, scenario of putting some of this into practice, because I think this is this, seeing the visuals are what really help, I think, kind of like make it click. So for this scenario, we're going to pretend that we're a small bank, but we're very, very busy. All right. And when I say we're a small bank, I mean, I mean we're pretty small. We've only got 10 branches around the Los Angeles area. All right. At each of our branches, we have 10 tellers who work at that branch. And each of those branches, our bank branches around Los Angeles, has about 100,000 accounts, bank accounts. And if, so this is all we really need to track in our database. We have our branches, we have our tellers, we have our accounts. Oh, and one more thing very important is, you know, the auditors, the regulators. So of course we have to keep an audit history. And we are a bank, so what we do is we keep track of money. So the main thing that we're going to be doing is that people come into our branches and they deposit or withdraw money. So our basic transaction that we do as a bank is pretty simple. I have it on the left side of the screen. Um, the first thing you do when somebody comes into the bank and they walk up to a teller is we're going to just update their account and, you know, set the balance to whatever the new balance is. Uh, and then we're going to be pulling the balance out, the new balance out, so that we can put it on their receipt, okay? And then just a few more things. We are a bank and we do want to keep track of how much money changes hands between uh, the tellers who are working at that bank. Uh, and then we also want to keep track of how much money is in this branch total. So we're also going to do that. We're going to update, you know, keep track for the teller, keep track for the branch. And the very last thing, of course, will be to insert our audit records into our history table. So pretty simple. This is pretty simple. Now, uh, most of you have probably caught on by now that I did not come up with this idea. This was, in fact, invented by Jim Gray and first published on April Fool's Day in 1985, although it was no April Fool's joke and, in fact, this paper from Jim Gray changed the database performance field forever. Um, something you may not have caught, uh, but is really fun if you didn't know this story, is that this uh, is called the debit credit benchmark, was what it was originally called. And Jim Gray came up with this kind of bank idea. Um, that w it was, if you haven't heard the stories, he didn't just invent this. He actually worked with a real bank in the 1980s who were specking out and buying a, buying a new computer system. And they wanted to figure out, like, where they could get the best price per transaction. 
Um, and I, I, think it's, I think it's a great story. Like, they ended up getting two bids. He sort of mentions it in his article that he published. Uh, one of the bids was for $5 million, the other from the startup, the other was $25 million from a very well-established uh, tech company. They went with the $5 million bid, and their target, like for $5 million, okay, they wanted to buy a computer system that could do at least 100 transactions per second. At least 100 transactions per second. So that's what we were shooting for. So what happens if we run this? Now, of course, this is an old benchmark. Um, I, you all probably realize by now that this is packaged with Postgres. Out of the box, it's called PG Bench. Um, built right in, very easy to run and test. So what happens if we run this? Well, we are smoking fast. We get a whopping 6,000 transactions per second, and you did not have to spend $5 million for that, thankfully. Um, so this is pretty cool. Uh, so what I've done here is I just ran PG Bench. I've got the commands. You could run this yourself if you want to try it out. This was on uh, a Xeon Ice-like box with a half a terabyte of memory and 64 uh, threads, a 64 thread processor. And yeah, I topped out. We topped out around 6,000 transactions per second. Now this is kind of more of the way that I structured this. This is really more of a throughput test, right? But here's a question. So okay, we know we know we can get. 6,000 transactions per second. So let's, let's fire this thing up, and I'm going to connect 100 clients and just run my 100 clients full bore. So you see from the bottom here, at 100 clients, that's right at our peak. We're, we're running around 6,000, a little over 6,000 TPS. So when I fire up my 100 connections, what would you expect to see on the server? What would you expect to see? Let's, let's try the old method first. The old method was where we pulled up all of our counters, our metrics. Now, we are pushing this system to the saturation point, right? Like, this system cannot push any more transactions per second through than what we're doing. We're at the limit, 6,000. You know, if we wanted more, I don't know, we probably need to get like a very fancy distributed system or something, right? So here we've got our 6,000 transactions per second. We're getting our super high throughput without spending $5 million. But if you look at this, the CPU utilization is like 5% on this box. Our disk metrics are, the, the disk isn't even breaking a sweat. The, the latency is down under a millisecond. The throughput is like, doesn't even register compared to what our limits are. The buffer cache hit ratio is at 99.94%, which is very good. And you can scroll through pages and pages and pages of, of CloudWatch metrics and system metrics. And um, let me tell you something, you're actually not going to find anything that looks suspicious. Every single, by every single metric, system metric that you look at, this system looks idle. It looks idle. So why are we topping out? Wait. Well, let's try the new method. The new method, the right method, is to start with weight events, just to look at sort of a profile built on response time and built on weight events. So, we're going to go to that visualization I was sort of talking about at the beginning, where we do average active sessions, and we sort of stack them vertically. So I'm going to just sort of walk through a few things in this screenshot. First of all, right off the bat, it's a very different picture. All of a sudden, the system looks very loaded. I have a black arrow on the left, and it's kind of this light gray line. That's the number of cores of CPUs I have on the box. There's 64, that was 64 threads I talked about. And we're running like 100 connections, 100 processes on this thing are running, are, are busy all the time. So this is a load, which lines up. We had 100 connections, right? So 100, 100 processes are running. Um, suddenly it looks very busy. Now, if we go down to the bottom, we're actually going to work away from the bottom up. Uh, I realize it's going to be probably hard to see in the back. But on the very bottom, one of the things that Performance Insights does that is nice. Um, now, this was a four minute window of time, okay? And what, what it's done here is it's, We've, remember, for four minutes, what we did is every one second, I grabbed a snapshot of PG stat activity. And this is summarizing those, all of those snapshots. Four minutes, we're talking four times six, 240 data points here. All right, and then we've summarized them. So what we see is there's basically two SQL statements that are dominating that data. And the numbers mean something. The numbers mean that on average, during that four minutes, if you grabbed any average point in time, about, on average, 48.80 connections are typically trying to update the tellers table. 37.81 connections are probably trying to update the branches table. And then the second thing is you have the color bars. And the color bars tell you for that specific SQL statement, what are the weight events. 
And the ratios are actually pretty similar. The ratio is probably about like 60-40, something like that. And about 60% of it is that kind of light brown color. About 40% of that is a more reddish looking color. And it all correlates. Those two weight events are a tuple lock and a transaction ID lock. The real power of this and what I really want you to take away isn't necessarily the specific events, but it's how when you start with a dashboard like this, it just immediately draws your eyes to the problem. And this doesn't just work for tuple locks and transaction locks. It works, it still works for all of the classic old problems like just CPU being saturated, disk being slow. It works on all of these. Like it will immediately draw you to what's the bottleneck in the system right now. So if you're not familiar with a tuple and a transaction lock, you just Google it, go to the RDS docs, and basically it's going to tell you really simple. You just have a hot record, which actually isn't that surprising when you think about it because this is a database. If everybody's trying to update for this one branch at the same time, you know, it, we have to sort of, you know, the updates can't all happen at the same time or you would lose data, right? So if you have three updates, you have to wait for the first transaction to commit or roll back because you have to know, is it going to commit or is it going to roll back so the next guy can know what's he starting with to do his math. So I'm just going to, there's a lot of ways you could address this, but we're going to do it real simple. Just kind of simple thing is just instead of having every transaction update, tellers and branches will schedule a job, run it every few seconds, update them in batch. This is such a common thing. It's built right into PG Bench to skip steps four and five. You just tell PG Bench run simple update mode. And here's what we get if we do this. I've put the scripts again on the screen so you could run them, try it out yourself. Optim this simple optimization to our application has taken us from 6,000 transactions per second up over 30,000 transactions per second. So we've got like a 5x speed up. Now, again, like don't, the numbers aren't really the point. Um, but the important takeaway here, the really important takeaway is, is a couple of things. One is this, if you have a hot record, is a distributed system going to make you any faster? Is a bigger server with more CPUs going to make you any faster? No, right? Not in this case. Because you're, you're just, everybody's trying to update the same row. It doesn't really matter how many CPUs or how much scale out you have. So understanding like what your bottlenecks are is, is really crucial to, to understanding how to scale your load. This was a bit of a, an example based a little bit, you know, made up, but this does work in real life. Um, and a nice example of that was if you weren't tracking with it, uh, MidJourney had an incident in May of last year that uh, Kyla Haley gave some kind of high-level blogging about. And it's, it's a great object, it's a great example of how powerful weight events are. So in the MidJourney incident, they had an eight terabyte non-partition table in Postgres. This is all in Postgres. Um, outbound logical replication on that table. They were running eight to 10,000 queries per second on it. And in May, they had two incidents four days apart where all of a sudden the error rates at the application level just shot through the roof. And it came back to database performance. And these are the worst ones, right? Because there's no errors. It's like a brownout. And it's just things kind of start slowing down. But the amazing thing about it, and this was that they had all their dashboards set up and ready to go, is that you, you can see the screenshots over here on the right. The application error rate started spiking up to 1,000 errors a second, right around 7.37. Um, I don't know if that's UTC or if that's local time, but around 7.37. And directly below it is the average active sessions that they had. And what they saw, it just took, this was the first place that their main database operator looked. And you could immediately see that at the same time as the application error spike, there was this massive spike, 500 connections to the database sitting there on something that says LW lock lock manager is what they bumped into. Now, Kyle did some looking around. He did, that gave him the starting point that he needed to very quickly trace this right back to four weeks prior. And again, these are like the worst kinds of issues because like, you know, if the migration would have just failed, you could like roll back, right? If the migration hit an issue, like even three hours later, you can kind of deal with it. Four weeks have gone by. Four weeks have gone by. They're in a much more difficult position. You can't just like roll it back. It's not that simple anymore, right? But they had done a migration to partitioning four weeks prior, um, and they didn't roll back the partitioning, but that turned out to be one of the factors that was contributing to increased pressure on the lock manager system. If you're curious about the details, I've got a blog post that you can go read. But I'm 
very aware everybody's hungry, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I mentioned before, it doesn't just work on these. Uh, now, the lock manager is not a common weight event, neither is buffer content. The things that are common that you tend to see the most are things like the transaction locks, CPU, data file reads, wall writes for read and write paths, and there's some good documentation to walk it through it. Again, one last time, I'm going to put this slide up because I want this to be the last thing that you see and remember your methodology for solving performance problems on Postgres, time and walk through it this way. Scope it down, your top SQL, get your top weight events, get your explain plan, and I always ev end every presentation I do with what I call the happiness hints. You can find these on my website. These are a collection of things that I think every Postgres production database environment should have. Um, most of these are not, well, none of these are controversial, and most of them pretty much everybody I know in the field agrees on. There's a couple where my opinions sneak in, like the scaling area. Uh, but it's not controversial stuff. And just to mention it, there are a couple of these that directly relate to this entire topic that we just talked about of weight events. In particular, you'll see on the right-hand side, it says active session monitoring. It's basically saying, as a best practice, do active session monitoring. Have something in place that's grabbing snapshots of your active sessions of PGStat activity so that you have the data, have it always on, if there's some kind of an incident, you're able to go back and look at it and do analysis. There's lots of ways you can do that. And the one other thing that's on here is under the alarming section, the number one alarm, I have it in bold because if you only have one alarm, this is the alarm you should have, and it is the alarm on average active sessions. Um, on AWS, it's also sometimes called database load. This alarm, uh, I used it for years as an operational DBA. Uh, it's an amazing metric and it's an amazing alarm. It, there's very few false positives and it works very well. You tend to be the first person to know whenever there's a database issue, a database performance issue. Like you just, you, your pager will go off or you'll get the email and you'll know, you'll be the first to know. It's a very, very good metric to have. Basically, you're just looking at the number of active sessions and then figuring out the right threshold and setting up, setting up your paging based on that. All right, so that's it. Thank you for coming by. If you have questions, I will hang around and I'm happy to hang out and chat and discuss, but I wanna kinda of make sure everybody is dismissed and free to go and then we can just sort of ask questions up here in case folks are hungry.